my honor this morning. I get to introduce Jim that you, none of you guys have probably ever met before. But uh, anyway, Jim is just a excellent, excellent Bible teacher and man of the word and man of the spirit. And Lord, we just uh, just thank you for Jim this morning, Lord. Father, I pray as he comes, that Lord, you would just uh, put a special anointing on him. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak stuff through him that would surprise him. Lord, just uh, just use him this morning, Father. It's my great honor to be able to introduce my good friend, Jim. Now, oh, come on up, Mr. Mr. Gifford. He asked me which podium I wanted, and I, I want the one I can see over. <laughs> so we're going with the small one. I'm speaking today on walking out healing. This all came about because I had a problem and I got prayer. And Teresa and Sherry urged me forcefully to testify about walking out the healing. Okay, a testimony. I'm doing much better. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Close my Bible and go home. <laughs> and it was suggested that maybe I should uh, teach on a little bit of what we've gone through. That there might be revelation. And so here I am. Only one page of notes. So we won't be here too long. As far as healing in my life, I've experienced a lot. God has been gracious. First really time that I really experienced it, I was at Cal Poly, senior year, last quarter, the week of finals. I taught at church, I went home, and then I was in excruciating pain. Went to the hospital, had a kidney stone. I have finals that week. If I don't take my finals, I don't graduate. It will be summer. Instructors will be scattered throughout the world where I have to arrange for an alternate time to take the final. I'll probably have to retake the courses. I go in. Doctor does the tests. I do the scans. Yeah, you have a kidney stone. And because you have one and you're so young, you will probably battle this throughout your life. So, a wonderful um, prophecy. <laughs> so, I went through the process, and then the, the doctor said, we need to hold you for a couple of days. And I said, no, I'm leaving. I have finals. He said, you're in no shape. I said, if I have to crawl to my test, I'm crawling. I will graduate my class. And I said the same thing to God. And God healed me. It suddenly, I guess, dissolved, never passed it. The pain was gone. And I did go and graduate my class, took my finals. My study day was spent with IVs. <laughs> but it didn't matter. God was faithful and he met me. So a couple of weeks later, a thought came to mind. What do you think will, how can you prepare for the next time this comes? And you know, I just kind of looked at uh, the scripture and you don't have this one. First Peter 2.24 says, he bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and he gave his life for righteousness, by his wounds we are healed. 
And my thought was, God doesn't do stuff halfway. I am never going to have another kidney stone in my life. I don't care what somebody's predicted over me. It's not going to happen because God is not a halfway God. I've discussed this with some pastors, and some of them have explained to me that healing is not in the atonement because sin, forgiveness of sin, is eternal. But you're going to get sick again. And I thought, hmm, I probably will get sick again, but not from a kidney stone unless I let you talk me out of this healing. If I believe that it's coming, it will. And if I believe I'm protected, I'll never see it again. That was over 50 years ago. I've never had another kidney stone. A few years later, I had the Wednesday night service. I went home, got very sick. Deborah took me to the emergency room. The doctor looked at me, went back in the back and fell asleep. She went and found him, shook him righteously. Brought him back out. He called in other surgeons. I was concerned I might have appendicitis. It turned out to be a gallstone. So again, we prayed and God healed me. I didn't pass it. Don't know what happened. It's gone. And I applied this same scripture. And I've had an, never had another gallstone. So God is faithful. We've had that place where God has met me. I believe in healing. But I believe that if you're going to maintain your healing, you have to maintain your thought life. You have to maintain your thoughts. Now, I'll get to some other stuff later. That's not what brought up me teaching here today. But we've seen other things. We've experienced other things. Um, my wife, Deborah, I think it was on a Sunday afternoon, might have been Saturday, she fell and broke her wrist. Sprained it, broke it, did everything, you know, bad. We took her to the ER. We have x-rays. We had x-rays. And the wrist was broken. They put her in a soft cast in a sling, sent her home. And she was in a pain level of about eight or nine for three days. On that Tuesday, we took her to the healing rooms. We were open Tuesdays then. And brought her in here. And she was prayed for. And God healed the broken wrist. However, he did not heal the sprained wrist or the bruising. What did you learn then? Well, I learned that I had a box uh, for miracles about expectations, what they would look like, you know, how God did miracles. And that's not how he did mine at all. Um, these wonderful people prayed for me, and he did heal the break, but I still had to suffer with the sprain for a couple weeks and with the inflammation and the bruising, and um, it just didn't look like what I thought. You know, I was always taught that if he does a miracle, it's perfect. You know, it's perfectly healed, and well, this was different. <laughs> didn't fit into my box and I thought you know God has so many ways that he touches us 
and it's each individual, you know, and it's so important that we listen to the Holy Spirit, what he's doing, what he wants from us. And I just felt like I got double blessings because I, I got the blessing of a miracle, of a healing, but I also got the blessing of having to work through the pain, um, not pain, but the healing of the sprain and all that. So I had to be patient and wait for that to heal. And people would look at it and go, ooh, you know, that looks so awful. But but I'm, I had a miracle, you know. <laughs> so you have that kind of that conflict and of how to explain it to people. And um, you also have more empathy for when someone else has broken something, you know. So I felt like I got doubly blessed. <laughs> she met another lady probably three weeks later that had fallen and done exactly the same thing. And she was in agony. And Deb had pain levels of, oh, nothing, or two, if I try to pick up something, maybe I should use my other hand type of thing. A little bit later after that, this is going to sound terrible for her, but she fell again. <laughs> Broke the ankle, right? Broke the ankle. And so, back to Twin Cities. <laughs> X-rays, fracture, soft cast, crutches. It was on Tuesday. So on the way home, we came here and went to the healing rooms. I learned something about Deborah. De she is incredibly graceful she's been graceful through her life you see her going down a mountain on skis i can't keep up with her she's doing a perfect swallow everything is good put her on ice skates she can turn around and do minor twirls not olympic stuff but she can she twirls put her on roller skates she's fast she zigs she sags i can't stay close to her because she takes too much room kicking to the side to go that fast incredibly graceful put her on crutches she's dangerous to herself and she's dangerous to anyone within 10 feet of her so we pulled up here in front she came to the door and was taken to the back dangerously and Teresa Sullivan was on the group that prayed for her. She is an RN at Twin Cities Hospital. And she's the nursing supervisor there. So they pray. They take off the soft, soft cast. They take away the crutches before she hurts somebody else. And she walks out healed. So, again, miraculous healings, God touches. But what if they're not miraculous? What if you have to walk it out? Anybody know who Heidi Baker is? Everybody's shaking their head, yes, that's a good thing. Missionary to Mozambique, an apostle. Tremendously powerful woman. Well, after she graduated from Vanguard University, um, Deb and I went there. So, you know, my classmate. And <laughs> ten years later, I never met her. <laughs> she spent six months in Alaska, bedridden, MS, couldn't get out of bed basically dying. Now, during that period of time, I know she wondered, where are you, God? During that time, you may start by wondering, where are you, God? But you end up by pursuing him and getting to know him. The result of that 
is perseverance. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, this print so it looks so much bigger at home. <laughs> we rejoice in our sufferings because we know suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Six months, she learned perseverance. When I saw her at a conference 25 years ago, I think it was the year 2000, so 24 years ago, she mentioned the Alaska experience and how she had trained people under her and they learned perseverance under her fingers at that time about 50 people raised from the dead but the one story she talked about for having learned perseverance was one that she had trained they have orphanages the last at that time the orphanage had 2,000 kids in it. One of the toddlers probably died. And one of her workers picked the child up and held the child for three days. She walked around. She carried her everywhere. She never set her down. Three years, the child is in her arms. Three days. Yeah, that's a long time. <laughs> Three days. Child's in her arms. If we think about Jesus raising Lazarus, you know, Jesus said, roll the stone away. And Martha said, he stinks. He's decomposing. Three days. That's terrible. We don't want to open that up. She drug her wherever she went. She carried the child. And after three days, the child came back to life. Now, when we hear of people being raised from the dead, we have this thing of like Lazarus, you know, you come hopping out of the tomb. Generally, when people are raised from the dead, they have to start the process of healing. They're basically at the point at which they died. So the child had to go through that process in order to be raised up. When Heidi was healed from the MS and being bedridden for that six months, she had to fully recover. After six months, you could hardly walk. Your strength is gone. Your balance is gone. Very, it's, it's a double miracle. If somebody comes out, let's say like the beggar at the temple that Peter touched, where they come out leaping and praising the Lord. <laughs> double miracle. When a deaf mute is healed, they've never heard language the tongue is not trained speech is foreign they don't know what they're hearing a siren could be english nothing makes sense and they have to begin the process of learning unless god chooses to heal that too that's a double miracle but in the process of healing we want to watch what we're expecting so many times we may say, well, they're not really healed. I mean, yeah, they got them up out of the bed, but they didn't hardly walk. Our expectations creates doubt for their healing, which gives the enemy the opportunity to come in and take the healing because they don't walk like me. In that place, we got to allow both ourselves and other people the 
grace and ability to walk out that healing that they have. Two other people I want to mention. You, do you know Amanda Grace and Julie Green? Powerful modern day prophets, right? Well, Amanda Grace was bedridden for a year before she was turned loose in her ministry. God called her to open an abused animal sanctuary. She did that. And then she was paralyzed, I don't know why, a year in bed. She came through that and got her anointing and her calling. Perseverance. Suffering. Perseverance. Character. No. For so many people, they haven't gone through the process. They missed the process. And what's missing is character. And what happens, they fail. Because the character doesn't carry the anointing. Julie Green, I believe, if I remember her testimony right, a year in her wheelchair. You'd never know it now. But persevered through. So, my process. Oh, by the way, that in that place, Psalms 144 and Psalms 18, the main things are there is he trains my hands for war. So this becomes part of the process, can become. When we're in training, we don't practice what we do well. We have to build endurance, and soldiers run all the place with a backpack. When I was in training for baseball, and when I was young, they didn't roll balls to me. Balls were hit firmly to one side and to the other. You learn how to go over, pick the ball up, and make a twisting, accurate throw. If they're going to roll the ball to you, everybody's the shortstop. If you can make the hard plays, you're the shortstop. I worked hard at making the hard plays. My process was, I had a tear in my diaphragm. Didn't know about it. But when you lift heavy things and your diaphragm is torn, the intestines are pushed up by the muscles into the thoracic cavity. What happens then is the lung gets flattened and pinned to the chest, to the side. And I had intestinal material up to the top of the heart. The only thing working was the left side of my lung at a low level. So this was discovered because I was having some pain. So they sent me for a CT scan. And the doctor who found it didn't know what it was. It's called a Morgagni hernia, and it's written on the CT scan and was written there for a couple of years before it was really diagnosed. So when they started doing it, it was I was sent down to get a, a colonoscopy, and the doctor there sees that written there, and he said, what's that? He looks it up on the internet and reads it to me. And he says, I ain't touching you. You're dangerous. He said, if anything goes wrong, you're going to die on the table. So he sends me to another doctor. And the doctor says, huh, wonder what that is. Looks it up on the internet and reads it to me. At this point in time, I think I might as well read it to myself and maybe do a little other research rather than have people explain to me that, uh, well, the internet says... Basically, the internet says this is not good. Okay, I can agree with that. They sent me to a surgeon. The local surgeon says, you know what? This is Dr. Boulevard. He's one of the best in the county. He says, I'm not qualified to touch you 
and neither is anybody else here. So you're going to UCLA or Stanford and you should get it done quickly. Well, six months comes and goes because they, they are busy. And so I finally went, they did the work, patched the diaphragm and got the intestines where they're supposed to be and stuff like that. And the doctor said, if your lung reinflates, it will be in six to eight months. I don't know if it will. Now, I'm a simple guy, you know, run an air hose down there and fill it up. I've seen, I've done this with tires. <laughs> you put air in there, it goes, poop, and then you're done, you know, just like an inner tube, not a problem. Apparently, when the lung is flattened against itself, you get scar tissue on the inside that builds a pretty good web. And so if you blow it up with air, you tear those sacs out and you tear the lining out and the lung doesn't work anyway. So it's pointed out to me that I have a problem. Now, I have a problem, so I come here to the hidden rooms and I get prayer and I go home and I'm having low oxygen readings okay I want to see what this look means so look it up on the internet and read some pulmonologist reports and they say well if you get oxygen very low that what happens is your heart works really hard but it's not getting proper oxygenation to do the work that's required of it and heart problems develop and it's not pumping enough oxygen to the brain and so the brain cells die and so you get to die of a heart attack with dementia <laughs> Oh, such wonderful news that doctors bring. Have you ever noticed that when you go to doctors, they start talking about what they can take away from you? They start with your money, but then they move into anything you enjoy. What do you enjoy eating? Oh, you can't have that. What do you hate? Well, you're going on a cauliflower diet. <laughs> then we won't have to worry about your weight because you're going to be skinny. There's no doubting of that. <laughs> so, with all the ominous reports, I think, okay, God, oh, by the way, we asked for a reference to the pulmonology department at Stanford. They never got around to wanting to see me to offer an opportunity. We called a doctor in... Santa Barbara, who is highly recommended, and he wants all the records, and nobody would, Stanford wouldn't send the records, and my other doctor wouldn't send any records, and so nothing kind of happened. It's, it's kind of like that. God is closing some doors. If an opportunity opens up, I will go. I'm not opposed to doctors. But I don't think they can help me nearly as good as God. The thing is, I have got to enter in to my healing. If I am going to sit in a lazy boy <laughs> reading for nine or 10 hours a day, I don't need much oxygen. If I'm going to live a life that I want to, that I've always done, then something has got to change in my body. So we start the process. I bought an ox oximeter.
Fairly good one. Not great one. Fairly good though. Accurate. $30 on Amazon. Not a big deal. And I started monitoring my oxygen levels and paying attention to how I was doing. What I found is when I really was blown out, and I've been this many a times because I'd go out and work a little bit and, and come home and I was exhausted. My oxygen could be at 82, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, and my heart rate may be at 110. So I'm working my heart very hard to sit down and put this on my finger. How am I doing? So it's 93, that's good. Wow. 93, okay, that's a lot better than 82. I have seen, the heart rate right now is 100, but I would expect that because I'm in front of you guys and you guys get scaring me. What was I saying? I lost my train of thought. Um, the levels. Intervention starts at 94 and below. If you're below 90, I've learned, they won't let you out of the hospital without an oxygen tank. When I was in the hospital at Stanford, laying there with the oxygen turned up to seven liters, which is very high, would you say, Mark? Your bottles can only produce about four. They cranked it up to seven to get me to 88. I know that I need God's intervention. I'm supposed to be dragging around an oxygen bottle. And when it goes to a certain level, I'm supposed to start breathing oxygen. What I've done is I've commanded my body to operate as Jesus made it. When I find that my oxygen is getting low, and for me that's under 90, I, I function pretty good at 90 or 89, but when I feel like it's getting low, I sit down and I breathe deep and I command the body to do what it's supposed to do. At times, I've tested myself, and I'm feeling pretty good. I've seen 99, 98. Most of you will be 97, 98. Few will be at 99 or 100. I've seen 100 at times. But I don't see that when I go out and work. But... Going out and working is what I do because that's training the body and putting a demand on the body, a reasonable demand, where I can come in then, and it may be down 88, so I may suck on some oxygen for a little bit, 10, 15 minutes, maybe two hours, whatever it takes, and relax, let the heart rate come down, let everything balance itself and keep living life. That is walking out my healing with the Lord Jesus Christ. That is knowing him and believing that he is going to completely heal me. Now, I, I, exp I have reasonable expectations, okay? I'm not trying out for the Dodgers next week. I realize that I'm older than their coaches and they're probably not gonna want me. 
Besides, they didn't want me when I was 20. <laughs> so, I'm going through a process where I'm living my life doing what I need to do in order to be healed. Now, if you come to me and ask for a prayer, I expect the same thing from you. When somebody comes to me, I'll gladly pray. But one of the first things I expect is the first thing you're going to do is kill fear in your life. You're not going to pet the devil. If you do, you're not going to get your healing. If you want to be healed, you got to participate. And one of the major things to remember, if you are ministering over people, you can't want their healing more than they want it. So a, a plan needs to be made for each individual as they walk out their healing with God. Don't have to be with me. But if you go to prophetic people, they might have a little discernment. And they might mention a thing or two that needs to be improved in your life. Honor that. Honor them by taking words of knowledge and applying it. And in the process, you want to focus on what's right. So many people I've prayed for, I've been healing them for 16 years, I think. We prayed for so many people, and they come in. Oh, yeah, my neck is hurting so bad. I really need prayer for my neck. Okay, we'll pray for your neck. You pray for your neck. How are you feeling? Well, my knee still hurts. <laughs> what? <laughs> what about what we've prayed for? So a couple of things is you want to focus on what you're getting from God and praise him for every improvement. When I see 95, I'm very, I give a lot of praise to God. That is a dramatic improvement from 88 with seven liters of oxygen pouring out to you. That's so dramatic. When you get prayed for, use common sense, but do things. You get off the lazy boy. You don't sign up for a marathon. You don't take up kickboxing. But you praise God for what you get, and then get from him what you need to do to improve. If we pray for hearing, the stuff is just coming to me. So if we pray for hearing, concentrate on what people are saying. A lot of times as people's hearing diminishes, I'm going to say this. I brought my dad here. My dad was incredibly hard of hearing. The reason was during World War II, he was on artillery and fired the big guns for years that they didn't have ear protection or anything else they just fired the guns and and he lost most of his hearing like 90 percent gone but one of the things i'd tell him okay dad yes he always saying pray for my hearing okay i can do that but look at me when i'm speaking <laughs> Try to hear me. You get used to not hearing stuff and you pay no attention. Look at me. Try to understand me. So try to enter in, to participate in hearing what I'm saying and try to participate in the conversation. So that's one of the things. And you work out everything with with God 
one of the scriptures I'm jumping to Luke 6 it talks about Jesus and it says he healed their diseases and he cast out the evil spirits many times evil spirits are participating in the the pain we're having the problems we're having we got to recognize that now back when i was young in college and especially with the the second one the gallstones twice i spoke at church went home went to the hospital I'll tell you what, that's the spirit of witchcraft coming against you. If I'd realized at the time, but you know, I'm Sherry sure hadn't bothered to teach me anything then. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because you were five? <laughs> <laughs> if I'd realized that, we would have started probably at a different point. God still met me. But obviously the timing suggests something that we don't want. And Christ would discern. And for many people, he healed them by casting out the spirit. The boy with um, epilepsy cast out the spirit. The woman with the issue of blood, just touching him of his garment, healing, differences. Differences appropriate to different things. So, now, what if it don't go away? If it don't go away, 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Three times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so the power of God can work in me. Sometimes God allows something to linger. It's for his glory. And it doesn't feel like it. The one who was born blind. And his disciples said, why was he born blind? And Christ said, for the glory of God. Well, you know what? If he was 35 years old, that's a long time to wait for the glory of God. But he received the glory of God and will be rewarded for that. Sometimes God just lets something hang around. Now, I don't, people have wondered what Paul was talking about. Some have questioned his eyesight. Some have said it was a, a harassing spirit, you know, a demon. I really can't imagine demons hanging around Paul for very long. And I just wonder if his guardian angel wouldn't have sliced him up. But some things were allowed. And part of that, I'm going to speculate. I can't prove this. But part of it was Paul was given so much revelation and so much power that having something wrong in his life protected him from pride. So we'll just throw that out there. I'm not saying that this is everything. And what I'm talking about here for me and everything, this is my road to healing. I'm not declaring that this is a yellow brick road. I'm not going to be the little minion hollering, follow the yellow brick road around you as you're dealing with stuff. <laughs> this is my route. So... Finally, looking at Mark 11, 22 through 25. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus said to his disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you the truth, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. And now the qualifier. But when you are praying, first, I wish he wouldn't put that in there. It's so much easier to have faith. We'll put that on hold for just a minute. Just leave it up there. What is faith? What is faith? Substance. It's something. Um, okay. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. She knows the scriptures so well. It's the evidence or substance of things to come. Oh, no, I just forgot it. It's, it's the evidence or substance of things unseen and the hope of things to come, the assurance of things to come. Okay, great. What's faith? <laughs> what does that mean, though? It's, it's, um, it's up as the evidence of things that, and the assurance of things to come. It's... It's a trust. It's a trust. It's a trust. Okay. And faith works by love. It's a trust that you that you that that you love and that your father's gonna take care of you. Okay. Lily Sue. Believing. Believing. Good faith. It means know your God, converse with your God, and believe your God. That's what faith is as far as an actual day-to-day -day definition that you can walk with. If God says it, then it doesn't matter. I'm going to quote a famous philosopher, Wes. It's in the book. Now, I will elaborate on that for those who think that's too taciturn. If God says it, it's true. It doesn't matter if you understand it or not. It doesn't matter if you can apply it or not. It's still true. And what has to change is you. Because that's truth. If we don't understand something, we have a tendency to dismiss it but it's in the book. We must change. So, we want to partner with God. Part of the process of partnering is this qualifier, which we, none of us like. First, forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins. Oh, wonderful. I got all the faith. I, I worked up faith. And what happens? That one person who can trigger everything comes by. And they come by with their greed, selfishness, anger, their hypocrisy, their disrespect, whatever it is. And we kind of flash 
because they know where the trigger is and they pull it every time they come by. Such marvelous people. <laughs> I hope they make it to heaven and I hope God puts them on the other side. <laughs> But if I want to move in the power that God has given me authority to move in, I got to keep clean slates. I can't have a ledger cluttered with feelings. And if we do, the enemy will come and he will tug on that and he will place memories of how we've been offended. It will be all sitting right there to block our re release of faith. So short accounts and that is also critical for walking out your healing. And still, what if God doesn't come through? What if I don't find my healing? Hebrews 9.27 Ultimately, it's appointed to man once to die. There comes a point of time when, short of the rapture occurring, we will all face our maker and step into that place, the judgment. In those words, the judgment means we keep short accounts so there's nothing unforgiven in our lives. We follow him as closely as we can follow him. We forgive those who have offended us that 70 times seven that God spoke to Peter. Well, that may be per year if they live close to you. But we forgive and we put it away and we turn our thoughts thoughts toward righteousness whatever is good etc I'm in front of you guys so now that that scripture is is in the fog <laughs> whatever is good whatever is holy whatever is righteous etc so to those of us who have watched loved ones suffer there's a grace from God and I'm sorry but we just have to trust we keep short accounts we walk in the power we walk out the things that God has placed into our lives we continue to hear him we take his words as truth we remember that it's, it's in the book. And we trust God for his righteous judgment. I'm sure many of us are walking out healings. We have teams. It'd be a good time to get prayer if you want to. We'll release the prophetic to speak into anybody's lives that want it. God bless you all. You're my tribe. I'm here with my tribe. Love you all. <laughs>